Um, Yvette? Okay. Okay, welcome to everybody here today. Uh, just a note before we begin, I will be mentioning quite a few blogs and links during my presentation today, and I will make them all available on my website as a blog after this presentation. Now, social media and blogging, as Yvette mentioned, has always been an integral part of my career. I found my PhD scholarship via Twitter and blogged about that on the Thesis Whisperer blog very early on in my candidature. I have since moved up to holding a few paid academic social media positions. Now, I don't have all of the answers for you today, but I would like to share why social media is integral to my identity as an academic and why it is connectivity that drives me. It is intangible in so many ways, but invaluable. Now, if you would like to connect with me today, I am mostly over on Twitter, at Cherie Becker, and if you are live tweeting today, uh, please use the hashtag ACA Connectivity. All of my blogs and other social media platforms can be found over on my website at shariebecker.com. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions. Now firstly, let's have a look at the vast reach of social media. As academics, I'm sure we have all been told by our universities, bosses, 
and peers that we should be on social media. As researchers, we often join social media for research communication purposes. We have been told that we need to share our work, to broadcast our efforts, and to ultimately garner citations. Research has even been conducted which shows that social media shares and views may positively influence citation rates. For academics, this broadcasting of our work is often encouraged and applauded by universities. But this broadcasting also often sits uncomfortably with academics. We prefer that our work speaks for itself. Today we will talk not only about what makes us join social media in the first place, but also the deeper and more authentic reason for participating in social media. What makes us stay? This will not be a social media 101. Social media and blog developers have set up their platforms so that it is easy for anyone to join them. These platforms are intuitive and easy to use. I will not talk about the different platforms and what each is for. Today, I will instead talk about how to harness the true power of being an academic and a human on social media. How to engage and connect with others interested in your academic work. We will talk less about information broadcasting and more about sharing, relevance, voice, authenticity, and most importantly, connection. So having said that, why do academics use social media? These are some of the reasons that you may have heard before. As I have said, we join social media to post work content, to discover peers and papers, and probably most of us join out of curiosity. But let's be honest. These are the real reasons why we use social media. To legitimize our web surfing, to procrastinate, or to give us something to do during boring seminars. You might have a few social media platforms open right now. Now, I often get asked, do I need to be on social media? Do I have to be on social media? Social media and blogging can indeed be a divisive, divisive topic amongst academics. Should you or shouldn't you? My point of view is, just as with that dress, there is no right or wrong answer here. It is personal. For the record, I still see white and gold here. The thing is, engaging with and on social media is not an issue of should or shouldn't, but rather how and why, or to what extent and why. So today I will share my reasons why I see social media and blogging as valuable, moving beyond increasing citations and towards the benefits of connection. Now, even though many people see social media and blogs as frivolous, shallow, and trivial, as something that teenagers do, it can be and is more than that. Social media is a tool to forge connections with. Teenagers are often scolded for being tied to their screens when there are, in fact, real people in and behind those screens. Social media allows for deep connections that span the globe. It is not all frivolity and selfies. Speaking of selfies, the selfie has become a genre in and of itself, and the subject of Tumblr pages such as this one, in which academics post selfies and typically overanalyze them. Selfies have also become the subject of serious academic research. In my field of injury prevention, the selfie has become a danger in and of itself, with people unknowingly taking selfies 
right before their own tragic deaths. Social media itself has become a modern medium of connection that is deeply compelling in all sorts of interesting ways. So yes, social media and blogging has been called frivolous and a distraction from the real work by some, whilst others, such as Katie Mack and myself, wax lyrically that this is the real work. Why is this the real work? Well, let's first look at the role of social media and blogging in research communication. A friend of mine, Ross Tucker, recently shared a series of tweets on the importance of research communication. Scientists need to take more ownership of the wider communication and translation of knowledge. Otherwise, they're only doing half their job. This means that they must pay attention to and work on understanding how people want to receive complex messages and learn how to deliver them. It's difficult only because research is often not purpose-driven enough with a clear need. Communicating without relevance is impossible. Why hope that your life's work will make a broader impact thanks to someone else, assuming that you want this, when you can own it yourself? Failing to do this leaves doors open for the misrepresentation of science. That said, we aren't marketers or salespeople. Balance between accuracy and appeal is tricky. Being relevant does not trump being right. Find even one way to make your important work understandable or sticky. You won't be selling your soul. You'll just expand your influence. After all, science is a special kind of storytelling with no right or wrong answers, just better and better stories. Social media and blogging gives us a tool to bring our academic work off the page and into real life. So maybe communication is more important than technology. Conversation is more important than the platform. Social media and blogging allows us to participate in conversations with people we might not otherwise have the opportunity to interact with, to get new and different views outside of traditional spaces, to break down hierarchies. And so, Everything is a remix. Social media has enriched rather than impoverished academia. I often hear academics say that they now find more relevant information via their social media networks than they do via traditional academic platforms. This is a wonderfully authentic effect of the power of social media and a testament to the sharing economy that is thriving. The sharing of tacit knowledge is especially valuable. An example of this is Pat Thompson and Inga Mubin, the thesis whisperers, current open writing practice, where they have made their paper that they are currently in the process of writing open on Google Docs for all to see. This provides a wonderful opportunity for tacit learning, both for emerging and established researchers. As academics, we are particularly risk-averse when it comes to sharing ideas. We have come to believe that our research and ideas will be scooped if we share too much. This is simply not the case. In fact, sharing early and sharing openly protects your ideas as they become associated with you. Further. If you don't share your work on social media, someone else will do so for you. 
universities, journals, and our peers are already talking about our work on social media. If we are not part of this conversation, we cannot know what people are saying about our work, and we cannot then contribute to that conversation. Academics are no longer stuck behind closed office doors, anonymously plugging away at our work and dealing with successes and struggles alone and with quiet determination. The academics on social media have evolved into a community that is having an open and honest conversation. Academia is a thriving international society and, for the first time, we can candidly share our research and our experiences of life as modern academics through social media. And there is magic in that overlap. The divide between personal and professional is a false dichotomy. Owning and curating your online presence does not mean creating a professional persona, but rather being very clear on who you are and what value you have to add to the conversation. The vast majority of academics are drawn to their life's work through the intrinsic motivation that drives their passion, rather than fame or fortune. Twitter and blogs are not add-ons to academic work, <clears throat> but a simple reflection of the passion that underpins it. In fact, if we do try to divide personal from professional too much, it can backfire. Stories of assistants tweeting on behalf of people abound. This does not engage or connect with people. Authenticity is lost when the divide between personal and professional is too rigid. Academics are humans too, and it is, a, it is okay to be a human on social media. Neoliberal values do not play well in the world of social media. Social media is not traditional media. Connection, voice and authenticity are more important than broadcasting. So use social media to not only share your work, but also share the work of others to debate respectfully, to champion great work, and to share tacit knowledge. Social media and blogs are dynamic. This is not a one-way impartation of knowledge, but rather a two-way conversation. The key is always to add value, and never to add to the sea of white noise just for the sake of it. Listening, sharing, and contributing is vital. because everything is connected. It is always an exchange. Social media provides no perfection narrative, no imposter syndrome, no competency narrative, no hierarchy and no gatekeeping. Just humans with a deep engagement and passion for, for the work itself, for our life's work. The promotional narrative of Use social media, it'll increase your citations, has some truth to it, but tends to miss the point or the value that long-term embedded users express, which is that social media enables and enriches their engagement and experience as scholars. So therefore, social media is a form of networking without the obligatory small talk at conferences. This is, then, about so much more than research communication. Research communication gets us to join social media and start blogging. Connectivity is what makes us stay. Social media is then not a threat to our human connection. Social media is the connection. 
Now thinking today of academic connectivity, what is this? What is the state of feeling this connection? In some ways, when I read of the zombification of higher education, of disengagement and of self-interest, I see a lack of connectivity at the heart of this. We have forgotten to truly and authentically connect with ideas, with values, and most importantly, with other people. If we don't connect, we lose something special. When we are too self-focused or busy, we don't allow ourselves that space and time to connect. And we are too busy not to connect. Often researchers early in their careers still allow themselves to become immersed and connected with what is around them. As we travel our academic roads, we intellectualize, label, critique and self-categorize. This gets in the way of our con connectivity. We fool ourselves into thinking that connectivity is about surrender and submission. Yet connectivity is not about the self. It is about the other and about allowing the self to be open to the other. This actually requires confidence. Connectivity is then about strength. From this place of strength, Connectivity is also about vulnerability, to be open and to be challenged and to travel to places we don't yet know. Connectivity is essential and valuable to ourselves and our ideas. Like Wi-Fi, I am not sure that I can manage without this anymore. Connectivity means that we are linked, not ranked. It is not that academics seek fame and fortune via social media. Rather, as with most musicians, it is the intimacy of small gigs that we crave. It is that feeling of being part of something that is greater than ourselves, part of a community, part of a com conversation. We all crave connection. Academics are humans too. When we armor up, we lose our capacity for connection. Social media, contrary to popular belief, has created a safe space where our vulnerability and humanness can shine through. The most compelling conversations on social media are those which hold space for us to be unapologetically human. So what does connectivity look like? Well, meet Ron, the 90-year-old Reddit guru. Ron is a Reddit, ask me anything regular, who answers questions from all over the world. Questions such as, what was the worst day of your life? Or what does it feel like to grow old? The thing is, Ron is not just an older person using a computer in an adequate fashion. He is creating something that people use and appreciate and connect with. You can do this too. Be more like Ron. It is no longer enough to be stuck up in our ivory towers. We need to go to our community and invite them in. How do we do this? How do we go to our community and forge connection? Amanda Palmer is a crowdfunding musician and connector who wrote a gorgeous piece about how to forge connection in her book, The Art of Asking. The piece is about artists and musicians being up in the garret but it is just as true for academics in the ivory tower, and I would like to share it with you now. The garret, the one in the attic. I've thought about it before when asked about the music business. The garret belongs to that set of romantic notions we, we all have had or have. Painters, 
writers, musicians and how they work. Up there, with a pen, a paintbrush, a piano, by candlelight, alone, the space is isolated and fraught with artistic tension, drunk, chain smoking, agonizing, creating, up here, in the garret, separate. Then, down to the ground floor, out the front door, you have the marketplace, loud, the stores of exchange, the sound of bargaining and bartering and changing cash registers, it's crass, it's mundane, literally mundane compared to the garret. It's on and of the earth. I give you goats, you give me bread. I give you a handful of coins, you give me a paperback. I give you an Amex, you give me a Best Buy gift card. The marketplace is not artistic, it's commerce. It's the wild west down there in the marketplace of the internet. Carrying your fragile newborn, newborn work wrapped up in a blanket through the stalls can be agonizing. The market is dangerous, it's dirty, it's loud and filled with disease and pickpockets and naysayers and critics. It's easier not to do it. But there is another option, which is to yell from your window, to call to your friends below, your comrades in art and metaphor, and invite them up to your private party in the garret. This is the essence of social media. Finding your people, your listeners, your readers, and making art for and with them. Not for the masses, not for the marketplace or the critics, but for your hopefully ever-widening circle of friends. And you aren't totally protected from criticism. The moment that you lead out of the window and find your friends, you might sorry. You might be hit by a book or a rock if you look if you look down. But nevertheless, invite your friends up to the garret nevertheless. There is a difference between wanting to be looked at and wanting to be seen. One is exhibitionism, the other is connection. Not everybody wants to be looked at. Everybody wants to be seen. What is important is to invite your people into your garret, into your conversation, into your safe space, to absorb, listen, talk, connect, help and share, constantly. Don't give any thought to the critics and the naysayers, rather build your net of wonderful people who will support and champion you, as you do them in return, constantly. Instead of trying to fit into the marketplace of modern academia or into the marketplace of this world, use social media to find your network, your friends, and invite them up into your garret or your world. Your network may not work in the same field as you, but this is a strength. Each of us will and can do this in our own unique way. Those of us who identify as introverts can find power in the conversation that is social media. It gives us the breathing space to fully be present when we engage. Others will, pre will prefer a raucous party up in their garret. The thing is, there is no right or wrong way. All that matters is authenticity and connection. Invite people in. Social media, as we have seen, is a conversation, not a press release. Authenticity is key. Authentic caring inherently underpins why we all choose to work in this space as academics. Approaching social media as a public relations type platform is missing the point. 
Social media gives us the amplification to reach more people with the credible, credible information and ideas that we have. Don't look for credit and don't focus on reach and impact and metrics. Rather invite people in. Connect. Harness connectivity. And so social media is not frivolous and it is not about me, the individual. It is about more. It is more than that. It is a carefully curated community. I learn so much more from my community, <clears throat> from my community than they will ever learn from me. Mostly, I enjoy listening and learning always. There is no right or wrong way to do social media. It is not a matter of should I or shouldn't I. Rather, it is about deep connectivity. More people are now feeling brave enough to share their ideas and opinions and stories. And more people are reading more widely and thinking more deeply than ever before. We have a hunger to consume stories, to connect with others and to create our own work. Human nature has not changed. Technology has only provided a new tool. My academic experience would not be the same without it. So pick a format, any format, and I hope to see you out there. Start sharing and keep connecting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cherie. That was a great presentation. We'll now open the floor up, so if anyone has any questions, I can give you the microphone. You can let us know who you are and where you're from, and then ask your question. Looks like Gail Barrington, you've got a question. I'll give you the microphone, and you can go ahead and ask your question. Gail? Oh, hi. No, my question was just for Sherry's Twitter account, and I see it now, so thank you. Oh, okay. Perfect. Great, Gail. See you over there. You bet. <laughs> okay, so if anyone else has any questions, I can give you the microphone, or you can type your question into the chat, and then we can just read them out. Oh, looks like Charles raised his hand. Okay, Charles, I've given you the microphone. You can go ahead and ask your question. Hello. 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 Hi, Charles. Hi, yeah. Hello, Mike. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are okay. you? Hello. I'm fine. Um, uh, my question is, um, how do we use uh, this social media to better the lot of the um, vulnerable households or the vulnerable uh, children that we service. I work for Catholic Relief Services, so we're looking at how to use social media to also better the lives of those people that we serve. Did you get my uh, question? Sorry, can you repeat that again for me, Charles? I said, I'm looking at uh, looking at the background of the people that we serve. Most of these people are in the rural community and they don't have yes. access to yes. internet or wife or wifey. Now, uh, using social media as such, uh, uh, you know, how viable will it, will it be in terms of reaching them, in terms of passing message to them, or is just is it just for us programmers or implementers at the uh, at the uh, regional or at the country level? Mm -hmm. uh, Charles, where are you from? I'm from Nigeria. Oh, okay, great. Um, I grew up in Botswana, so I do, <laughs> I do understand. Um, I think, in my experience, um, people in rural and regional communities actually use social media more to connect uh, because they are quite isolated, and I think, um, I think it's a very valuable tool um, to connect with them. However, if that is not an option um, in the communities that you're working with, um, I think then that using social media to bring broader communities um, into your network 
is where the value lies for you. Does that answer your question? Yes, but I'm not looking at I myself now because already mm -hmm. we are connecting. Okay. You get it. We are connecting already. Oh, we share, we share our social stories. We share uh, our uh, program um, directions and strategies. Now, looking yeah. at looking at the people that we serve, how do we now ensure that this social media also works for them? Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in that instance, as you're saying, social media is less about you and more about them. And so I think yeah. that it has to come from their side. Um, social media isn't the kind of thing that we can impose onto other people and we cannot share the messages that we think that they need to hear. I think um, going into the community okay. and perhaps uh, you know, harnessing a few social media champions from within that community um, is more valuable okay. because they uh, understand how their people want to receive messages. Okay. Yeah, Great. that would be my advice. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks you. Okay, we've got a question from Lisa Costello. Lisa, I'll give you the microphone. You can go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, Lisa, are you on the line? Okay, she might not have access to a microphone, but she's written, I like your idea of linked, not ranked, but academia is ranked. Professors, associate professors, senior lecturers, lecturers. So what is your advice to help less ranked academics speak out with confidence? Being slammed can be damaging. Thanks so much for a great talk. Fabulous. That's a great question. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I think the inherent nature of social media um, is driven from, you know, the people who traditionally don't have um, a powerful voice in academia and so I think when we start to find those connections, those people who are on the same level as ourselves, uh, that critical mass of voices can often help for us to speak out um, more effectively or without that, that issue of power um, of being brought down by other people. The other side of it is that, of course, people who are ranked in, in academia often are not on social media. And so we do feel safer to speak out um, from within social media rather than traditional platforms. Uh, the final uh, element there is that, obviously, there are quite a few accounts that are anonymous um, that represent groups uh, that may not have voices in traditional platforms. And that is actually really valuable because we start to see different ideas, new voices, etc., on social media. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. 
Thanks, Sherry. And we've got another question here from Alex Clark. What is personal to personal in professional social media? Or when is personal to personal in professional social media? Well, my personal feeling on that, thanks Alex for that question, is that there is no such thing as too personal on social media. I think uh, the people who are most influential on social media are those people who actually get quite personal. Um, so there are a few people, even like the thesis whisperer Inga Mewburn does share quite personal information on social media. And I think when we approach it from a place of authenticity, when we're being ourselves, that means that we're doing it right. And I don't think that we can go too far in that case. Okay, thanks. We've got another question here from Tracy Blake. Tracy, I'll give you the microphone. You can ask your question. Hi, Sherry. Um, I was Hi, Tracy. <laughs> That's great to hear your voice. I can tell you too. Um, so so, I sorry, can I just say before we carry on, Tracy and I have been connecting over social media for a while now, but we've <laughs> never actually met in person, so this is great to hear her. <laughs> um, so my question was, it actually, I guess, dovetails a bit on the question just previously. Uh, in terms of what your thoughts are with respect to having multiple partners who are using social media as their way of connecting multiple stakeholders and how you thought social media might be a way to sort of evolve those relationships with respect to removing the, part, the power dynamics and inequities between stakeholders in the research process. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think an important part of that, that is um, the way that we approach social media and, and holding our own and holding our voice on social media. And I think um, in the case of social media, it gives us an opportunity to really think about how we want to convey messages and how we want to connect with them. Um, you know, when we're in a room with partners, that power dynamic really comes into play very quickly. But on social media, we can take the time to think about it um, and to connect in a way that is authentic to us. Um, and I think that's really useful. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thanks. All right. Great. See ya. Perfect. See ya. <laughs> okay. And we've got another question here from Gudrun. Ray, I'll give you the microphone. You can ask your question. Good run. Are you on the line? Yes. Um, I have a question for Sherry. I am a new academic, so how would you suggest to start using social media? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and it's something that I often get asked. Uh, the most important thing is to try and find out what the platforms are that people are already using. So Twitter is probably the biggest one for academics at this point in time. And what I would suggest is to join the social media platform and just to start listening. I think that's how most people start off on social media. We join and this sounds terrible, but we kind of stalk for a long while. Um, we listen to the conversation. We start to hear what people are saying. We start to follow conversations, find out where our people are, where our network is. And you can take as long as you like um, just listening, just watching the conversation. And I think that then organically grows into a point where you start to feel like you want to contribute to that conversation, that you have something to say. So I think don't feel pressured to immediately um, you know, add your voice to the conversation, but rather just go ahead and listen for a long while until you feel comfortable. Hey, thank you. Great. Does that answer your question? Um, it does. Thank you very much. Okay. See you. Okay. So let's think. So if anyone else has any questions, you can raise your hand or type them into the chat below. OK, 
Okay, so I don't think we have any other questions right now. No need to be shy, anyone. You can raise your hand, get your questions answered. I'm also happy to answer questions afterwards on social media. I will be around on Twitter for the next while if anyone's over there. Say hi. That sounds good. <laughs> Okay, well that looks like that might be it for questions. Um, so maybe we'll end uh, we'll end it here if no one else has any other questions, or you can connect with Shri on Twitter. Oh, uh, we've got another one here from Tracy. I'll give you the microphone. You can ask your question. Go ahead, Tracy. Um. My last question was just related to, I guess I was wondering how you thought you had seen um, social media and its use change even traditional academic forums such as as conferences or symposia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so social media has actually, for me personally, made a huge difference at conferences. Um, and I think in two different ways. Firstly, um, social media adds this rich what I call a back-channel conversation at conferences. And it always fascinates me to talk to people who, at conferences, who are on social media and who are part of that, that back-channel conversation. And then to talk to people at the same conference who are not on social media and who are not aware of that. And I think that social media enriches the conversation because it is in real time. Um, and it also helps to disseminate our research to people who can't be at conferences. Um, you know, so it, it takes that message to a much wider audience uh, than people who are just at the conference itself. Um, personally, the second part of that is that it really helps me to connect with people. Um, so I, I often prefer to connect with people on social media first, um, maybe to share a few tweets and a conversation. And that's a really easy um, icebreaker for when you actually do meet people in person then, especially as an early career researcher. Sometimes it's really hard to connect um, or to feel part of the group at conferences. And so when you are part of the group on social media behind the conference hashtag, um, it's really easy to go up to people and say, oh, that's, you know, you. It's really nice to meet you. Um, so that's been really helpful to me personally. Um, and really, yeah, that's, that's for me the best thing about social media conferences. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Tracy. Um, Shri, I have a question for you. What have you seen as some of the biggest blunders or errors that people make when using social media, or what should they avoid or try to avoid? Um, and I think this is something that I've mentioned um, in the presentation itself, and it's this idea of trying to be really professional on social media. Uh, so people who don't actually engage in the conversation, but who just put out tweets, uh, this is my work, this is you know what I'm publishing or what I'm doing at this point in time, and they don't actually ever share other people's work. I think that's a big mistake um, to make, and it really does not come across as authentic or as, or as adding value to the conversation. Um, so I think it's important to, to be part of a conversation rather than just using it as a broadcasting tool. Um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing for me. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and end there. Sheree, thank you very much for coming and speaking with us today and sharing your views.
Do you have any final Oh, words? thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to say thank you and thank you to um, IIQM and Atlas. Uh, this has been great to share with everybody. And as I said again, please feel free to connect with me um, to ask me any questions. Um, I'd love for you all to be part of my network. Um, so yeah, let's head over to social media and interact. Sounds good. Thank you everyone for coming. Have a great day. Uh, the next webinar in the Masterclass series will take place on July 14th and that will be Linda Liebenberg speaking on photo voice as more than just an arts and crafts project. Rigorous approaches to thematic analysis and dissemination. So you can go to the iiqm.uoberta.ca website and register for that webinar. You can also check out, uh, we've got our Thinking Qualitatively workshop series taking place next week. We've got over 40 workshops taking place here in Edmonton and we have abstract submission open for our Qualitative Health Research Conference taking place in October and we're going to be in Kelowna, BC this year. So hopefully we'll be able to see you there. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs>